Residents of Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, Mississippi. The capital of Mississippi is coping with a water crisis. Do you think about the water you are using and consuming every day? I mean, shouldn't access to clean water be a human right? States like Georgia have been listed to have the worst tap water quality in the country. Our Imperative Insights crew went and spoke with three Georgia residents who personally witnessed the impacts of poor water infrastructure in West Atlanta, and they're trying to do something about it. That it's our practices, you know, it's what we're doing. It's really that we mismanage the raindrops when they fall on the land. And so because we don't manage the stormwater properly, we get water quality problems. Traditionally, what we do is we put rainwater in a pipe. And then we also connect that same pipe to our sanitary sewage, which is everything we flush down the toilet or we that goes down into the drain. And so we get uh, what we got in Atlanta, which was a combined sewer system that leaked untreated sewage into our creeks, into our streams, into our backyards, into our schoolyards, into our homes. You know, there were these challenges around infrastructure issues. The second issue was around a tunnel, an eight mile sewage tunnel that was gonna be built to flow from the north side of town to southwest Atlanta. So under a lot of cities, they built these big dying tunnels to hold the raw sewage. The challenge with that is a lot of times because of the systemic racism that comes from not in my backyard practices. You know, these deep tunnels were often built in black communities. My name is Juanita Wallace, and I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia. The area that I grew up in was in English Avenue. We had the creek in our community, and it was named eventually Proctor Creek. But as a kid, it didn't have that name, but that's what it ended up being, Proctor Creek. And that was a uh, private place, a peaceful place for the kids in the neighborhood. And I used to love to go to the creek for two reasons. One, to get the crawfish out the creek to eat. And I could sit inside the hollow tunnel of it. And I like, used to like to hear that sound, the way the talk back echo back at you. So I used to go up on the end to sing and just to hear myself echo back. And you know, that was a peaceful place for me. Well, what was beautiful about that particular area was because all the outdoor live life around it, you could see the butterflies, the bees, you could see lizards, you could see frogs, you could see turtles. Today, to go around it, the creek, I don't see the flowers, I don't hear the birds chirping. And as far as the crawfish, I don't see them anymore, unless they're very teeny, where they was very large at the beginning, but because of the devastation around the creek, they have died away. And it's just like, it's a dead area. But back in 1912, they baptized in that creek. Well, this is the layout what went on in that particular, in my neighborhood. But you can't baptize in that creek today. When people came to the city that was, you know, used to the city, and when they brought those sheets with all this, whatever they had, when they took them off this truck, they started digging holes. And for me to see that, it changed my whole atmosphere of something I had never seen before was generated on the north side, waste that was even uh, generated in a, in a neighboring county, DeKalb County, was going to flow through those tunnels um, and be treated in southwest Atlanta. And so community residents said, well, if we didn't create the waste, why should we be treating it? My name is Dr. Nataki Osborne-Jilks. I am co-founder of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, affectionately known as WAWA. So the watershed, just kind of simply put, is the land mass that drains to a particular body of water. So every piece of land that there is, is a part of a watershed. My colleague, Daryl Haddock, uh, who is the Director of Environmental Education for Wawa, always um, kind of introduces the concept of watersheds by asking people to, you know, kind of cup their hands together. And if you can kind of imagine that this is a land mass and look at the creases, right, and the lines in your hand, those are the streams and the tributaries, you know, kind of the smaller streams that feed into the larger streams. And if there was water here, that water would collect, you know, in those creases, if you will. 
And so it's that land mass that, you know, drains to a certain body of water. The city of Atlanta had planned to build essentially what is a mini wastewater treatment plant uh, called a combined sewer overflow facility in John A. White Park, um, which is a, a park uh, right on Cascade Road in Southwest Atlanta. The plans were in play, but the community was unaware of this project. In fact, the city council person was not, you know, really up to speed on this project. But once he became aware, um, he, you know, held a meeting with community members and let them know about it. And many of our community elders began to organize, um, mobilize and to educate each other about what the city's plans were. But not only that, um, what the alternatives, you know, could be. So they researched what was happening in other communities who were dealing with this problem of combined sewers. And this is an infrastructure challenge um, that really dates back to the late 1800s. You have some of the beginnings of the combined sewer overflow system in Atlanta and in other places uh, in the late 1800s. Um, and at the time, this was the prevailing technology of the day. Um, you essentially have one pipe that carries both your um, domestic and um, industrial wastewater to our wastewater treatment plants, along with stormwater that's generated. You know, so just one pipe carrying these combined flows. And so if you can think back to the late 1800s, Atlanta was definitely not as populated as it is now. Um, it was not as developed as it is now. So when you bring that to current day terms, you now have this system um, that really can't hold the amount of flow that it's getting, both from the number of users to the system, as well as the amount of stormwater that is generated, you know, when it rains, because we have so much development. You know, when the community found out that there was a plan to put this mini wastewater treatment plant in a community park, they said, well, there has to be some other way that we can deal with this. And so those elders, you know, found solutions. Um, they advocated for those solutions and ultimately were successful in getting that plan sunset essentially, um, in favor of something that we call sewer separation. Um, and most of Atlanta um, is impacted by or served by separated sewers, but you still have a small portion of our city, um, less than 15% that is served by these combined sewers. And on the heels of those two victories, um, it was decided that there needed to be an organization in place um, who would not only deal with these negative you know, projects, ne negative infrastructure related projects in our communities, um, but that would also put forward a positive vision for what we want West Atlanta communities to be. And so out of those efforts was born the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. Um, and I and others um, came together, um, you know, residents from three different watershed communities, the Proctor Creek Watershed in Northwest Atlanta, Utoy Creek Watershed in Southwest Atlanta, and then the Sandy Creek Watershed, also largely Northwest Atlanta. Um, we decided that because we had some common issues and challenges with, with respect to issues around wastewater, issues around water quality, ultimately issues around flooding, um, that we needed to, you know, bring our collective, you know, resources, you know, know-how, um, you know, just harness our collective power to try to make an impact on water issues uh, in the city of Atlanta. We, we say that, that the infrastructure we're talking about is public infrastructure, yet we don't allow people from the community into the conversation so that they can speak in their own voice. We give engineer, engineering companies, academic institutions, and the political powers all of the ability to make the decisions about public infrastructure. And then we're not at the table, and we have a lived experience that's relevant to say, hey, even as you design and implement and attempt to pay for this infrastructure, you're failing us. And that's what's happening nationally, in my opinion. My name is Daryl Haddock, and I'm the Environmental Education Director for the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. We in Atlanta have really created a, a, an opportunity and perhaps a methodology to engage the community. So, you know, you've interviewed Ms. Wallace, you know, Wawa, understood that we couldn't be the subject matter experts that got invited to the table all the time, speaking for other people. We needed to democratize that. I need to support the individuals that can speak for themselves. Because if I silo my power, I'm not sharing my power. And so if, 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 you know, and so even as a scientist, even as an academic, even as somebody that's privileged, if I don't think about shifting power to those that are subaltern, that, that don't get a voice, that, that aren't at the table, then I'm perpetuating the inequities 
that are currently existing. Um, and so, you know, the work that we do, or I believe we've done, is really to provide interpretation, uh, support financially if possible, the work that community members do. And even in our name, you know, we're an alliance. So I hope that we move a little bit differently than some nonprofits that are operating almost in a corporate mode where it's more about, well, how can I acquire more markets, more money, more projects, you know, create more institutionality for me. You know, we're really trying to stay lean in some respects and say that, no, we're, we're partnering more. We pass more dollars through. In some cases, we recommend that the people we work with don't even need to be NGOs. So what Wawa, you know, does in terms of the recognition that process is just as important as the outcome, is that we want to make sure we're constantly sharing power. We're constantly providing uh, infrastructure and scaffolding for communities that may be at the table, who want to be at the table. And it's not about just competing with other nonprofits because that is part of the system that allows us to be ineffective. So as I've been an environmental educator, I've noticed that traditional environmental education, conservation education, experiential education, um, the connection to nature programming has largely worked with young people, especially young people of color, that are tracking and will eventually go to college. And so you, you keep providing great programs, taking these young people to the Grand Canyon, or you're taking them camping, or creating internships for them. I started to question, like, doesn't everybody love nature, at least when they're young? Uh, and so some of the programs that I've been interested in onboarding now have been working with members of our community who are formerly incarcerated, that have had challenges, that might be, you know, in a position where they may have loved nature at 9 and 10 and 12 years old. They fell into some challenges. And who provides programming for them once they're kind of trying to come back out um, and, and, and kind of an anti-recidivism, you know, kind of goal. Uh, and so we've been working with some of the community members and organizations that are working with those populations. So they're learning how to work in urban gardens. Uh, one of the uh, develop deliverables of, of one of the programs is they, they make a hot sauce. So they're a social entrepreneur uh, organization. Uh, but we were adding training for invasive plant removal, native plant awareness and installations, green infrastructure maintenance, that are very similar skills to what you would do in an urban garden or farm. It's just soil science and plant science and trees are just big, big plants. Uh, and we're hoping to augment those skills. And then one of the things we're offering in the way of connecting to nature is we take them on trips. Uh, one of the trips we go to is to Florida where they free dive and snorkel with sharks. And um, we also take them camping. Um, that we're really trying to develop a deep connection to nature, but connecting them through the work that they're experiencing with the programs that they're going through um, at the time. Because again, I'm a scientist, I'm not a social worker. Um, I don't have you know, counseling skills and background. So I'm really trying to figure out how what I do could be beneficial to providing you know, some of that entry point, some of that waypointing kind of back to nature. And we know that that's great for mental health. We know that that's building great uh, decision-making skills. We know that eventually those STEM skills will provide a ladder up in terms of education access and higher education. So yeah, I'm really trying to create uh, and co-design more programs with audiences that I would consider to be non-traditional in the environmental space. Uh, and that would include, you know, everybody who people might think would be undesirable.